they have to import onto everyone here. So without further ado, Jessica and Fareed. Hi. Glad to be here. <laughs> Hello, guys. Hello. So, Jessica, you mentioned I have like associate partner here, but yeah. uh, is that is that the latest title? It is. Okay. So Jessica is associate me. partner. Is, is your mic working? I think so. You guys. Yeah. Can yeah. Cool. yeah. Jessica is associate partner at K Five Global. And um, Fareed is strategic advisor at Quintuple Aim Solutions. And managing partner at Chest Capital. And managing partner at Chest Capital. So you both have a lot of experience. I think, uh, Jessica, if you start by introducing yourself. Yeah. So I took a circuitous path to venture. Um, and I started my career in the Peace Corps. Um, and lived in Central America for a few years. Best career decision I ever made. Um, I'm Bay Area native. I'm from Oakland, so I see a, a little Oakland native over there. Um, so the, the shirt's representing today. Um, I went to business school and policy school, worked as a consultant, um, was at Waymo for a few years, so happy to talk self-driving. I'm a big uh, promoter and supporter and very proud of uh, what Waymo has accomplished. Um, and then over a year and a half ago, joined a venture fund. We're split between here and Los Angeles called K5. Um, and we have primarily our investments are in B2B SaaS. And I spend most of my time in vertical SaaS. And then we also incubate companies very opportunistically, um, which you might see as a trend um, in some venture funds today. Happy to chat about that a little bit more. And thank you all for being here and spending part of your Saturday with us. I really appreciate it. All right. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm Farid. A little bit. Uh, so I was born in Iran, then Canada, then France, then US. So I've been all around. Um, my background is um, I found, founded a few companies. Uh, okay, exits. And then uh, a few years ago, um, after my last um, company um, got acquired, um, we started a venture fund called Chess Capital, Capital um, with the focus primarily on healthcare um, and um, bio, yeah, so. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm here to see if we can uh, talk about the experiences and what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's great to see so many faces of young founders and entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs and things like that. Um, I know that the topic is about 2024 and sort of looking forward. Uh, going, jumping straight into it, uh, do you have any thoughts about the fundraising climate in 2024 and how it's different from last year or previous years in general? I think everything is stage dependent. Um, and we can stick to the earlier stages. So I think what we saw in 2020 through the first half of 2022 is a lot of market exuberance. Everyone knows this. And since then, that market exuberance has toned down quite a bit. I think at the earlier stages, you haven't seen such a drop off in those, that fundraising environment and startups continue to raise um, and we're continuing to see that, that same velocity. I would say 2024, we're seeing more of a pickup in Q1, even mm -hmm. at the, those earlier stages. We also have a growth fund, so growth is continuing to pick up. We saw that kind of in the second half of last year as well. certain criteria to get to them. You, uh, they all do early uh, back in the day. Not all of them were. 
product and depending on your connections. Uh, because the best thing to actually get an introduction to a VC is not not from a cold kind of an email. Those things, even though, even if you get a meeting and some of them actually convert, it matters how you are connected to the VC. So um, if you have a, a somebody that they already had invested in uh, and that person knows you and knows your product, that's one of the best ways to actually get introduced. At the same time, the product itself matters. The product has to be fundable uh, and you should be able to show traction. And now we, I'm sure we will talk about what this means uh, later on, but if you actually have a product that can show to a trusted VC, so these two together, then you are in a good position. So to get to a trusted VC, you need some sort of a connection that is not a cold connection. Uh, like, sure, in like um, setups like this sometimes work, but the best ones are um, warm introductions from people that they already invested in, or actually from other VCs, not that great, because usually when you're a, a VC, transfers you to another VC, that means they didn't invest unless they are not really, that's not their field and that's why they made the introduction. Those don't work either. So it, it kind of matters as to how you're actually positioning this. I think um, founding is a series of well-made matches. It's a well-made match with your co-founder. Hopefully, I think co-founding relationships I, they, they are so important, but um, hopefully many of you are considering a co-founder. Um, it, it adds so much to the journey, your ideas, your ability to execute, your ability to split a very heavy load. Um, that also the match matters with the VC, the match matters with your customers, the match matters with every hire you make after that. It's just continuity. And so coming back to who your funders are, and there will be a series of funders in each round, round after round, um, there's not one path. So there's not just these one you know, set of VCs. Um, there are a series of really strong angels out there, angel networks, incubators. Um, and I, I would just open one's eyes to like the, the many possibilities and if that is a match. So... Um, certain VCs are really great at certain things, at certain stages, certain sectors. Find that mutual fit and that mutual match. Ask for intros. I intro companies that we can't invest in all the time because we're not focused in consumer. I know the check size might not fit. We aren't ready to move that quickly because our partner who really likes this thing is in Japan for two weeks. True story this week. Mm -hmm. Like, like I've seen great deals and I pass them on. And so also don't take um, I also see deals that I don't pass on. Um, and so if if you get one intro and people are, are putting your name forward and saying, talk to this person, this person, um, that's, a, that's a great path and a great outcome. And you're always kind of trying to find this mutual fit. Um, and so finding angel networks um, or angels who know how to continue to push you forward at that pre-seed, when you're beginning to bring in institutions, there's many questions um, that you can ask as you're finding that mutual fit for what you need and what they need as well. Um, so, Farid, I know you touched upon it a couple of times, uh, the, the, the product question, which is super important, obviously. Uh, what is it that you as a VC and, and you too, Jessica, are looking for uh, in terms of the product? What is it that would make a, you know, something investable into or interesting? Uh, yeah, that's the, the, the greatest question, especially when you, you are early on. Um, the, how you actually de uh, determine that the product is fundable, it's, it has some um, potential to actually be successful. So at least for my own fund, and that the way we are doing it is there are two distinct category of products that we are actually funding. Uh, and again, keep in mind, this is healthcare only and uh, biotech mostly. So, and not, we do uh, fund software companies too, but uh, not as much as maybe Jessica. Um, so the way we are doing it is um, you either have something that is, is, is a product that is made or uh, you're in, in the middle of uh, some research and you could actually show that there is traction. 
By traction, I mean, if it's a software thing, you actually have people that are coming back to use it. You may not have too many users, and that's totally fine. But the ones that you have really like something about your product, it may not be the whole thing. Some some parts of your product may be broken. Doesn't matter. But if if you have a buggy product and people are still making an effort to come use it, that's great. That's that's you you need to show that, which basically means, especially for software products, you you have to have um, um, analytics actually built in. I've seen so many companies that they have something and like they they can't show. Um, uh, if their product is being used or not, how often is being used, and that is the worst thing. Yeah, you have to build analytics from the get go, and you have to know what to measure. Uh, it's not usually the VC's job to tell you what to measure, even though we do sometimes. But uh, you have to figure out a just if, uh, some metrics that when you are measuring, you can justify that this thing shows that my product is being used. So that's the category of a product that is you, you, you have something. And then the second category that we personally invest in are uh, pure research out of universities. So those ones are a little bit different, um, especially uh, when you go to stem cell, those things are a little bit harder uh, to kind of uh, have some uh, could decide if it's a good product or not. But usually the way we do it is we have um, some partnerships in some schools, mostly in Europe and Israel. Uh, and I know VCs, some of them actually do it here. There is a fund that is only doing, for, for example, MIT um, uh, projects. And if you are in MIT, that's the fund to go to. There's, there's a bunch of funds that are doing school-specific funds. Um, so those ones, they usually have some sort of a supervisor, say some, some uh, partnerships that are early on. So some research are funded by, a comp by a, an organization or private or public that you know once this, this, there was an actual reason that this got funded because it solves a real problem. So that those are good indications for projects that are pure, like research and not software related. So those ones are li a little bit tricky, but I would imagine because we are in San Francisco, that's not really most of what you guys do. But it, if it is, I'll be m more than happy to talk more about it. Do you have anything to add to that? I think as you're all sitting here, um, you all are likely here because you saw a problem that you didn't feel was being solved. Something was not being met in the market. And distilling what that problem is and then distilling what your approach to solving that problem is really key to what we look for. And um, one's ability to state that clearly and also state um, the kind of different thinking, different approach, different execute, different insight um, that you are all bringing as founders to that problem is what we really look for. And then we also look for um, kind of team's ability to execute against that. We look at how big is the market. Um, I always press on what is the founder's understanding in that market, how they will stay differentiated um, as well, and a plan to stay differentiated. And you won't always have that figured out from day one, but there is an expectation that you have a thought process about how you will figure that out. Um, and being able to explain that is also really important as well. Okay, so uh, moving forward, and let's say that uh, those those steps are you know taken into account. Into account, uh, the founders have built a product that really has uh, you know this captive audience, and they've found the sort of they've gotten a warm introduction to um, the, the relevant VCs and all that. All that. Do you have any practical advice that you would like to give to somebody who's going to be pitching uh, to a VC? Anything in particular that you see founders sort of trip on or anything like that? Um, don't, when you're pitching, especially, that's something that I really see as don't be too defensive. Uh, hear them out. Uh, and uh, a lot of times, uh, these are real world situations that um, don't see it as to, oh, they are missing this information and all that, but see it as when you're running a company, this situation will keep happening, not with VCs only, within your own company. You actually have to deal with 
let's call it stupid questions. Um, so don't be defensive. Don't don't go back and say, oh, but you don't know. Like understand that. Uh, First of all, there might be something in that question that you just haven't looked at or um, don't have the experience or haven't seen it in the wild, or something that actually might not be the best question. But uh, how to maneuver that question and not sound defensive is actually a skill that you would need in running your company. That's my, but that's one of the top that just came to my mind. Yeah, I think about that. Um one. Um, there are no stupid questions, um, but um, a C or a customer or someone that you're trying to recruit to your startup, or treat them as users and you need to understand their journey. So depending on what customer you're talking to, you need to tailor the message of your company to here's a, we assume you have this problem. Does that resonate? Listen to them. Um, here is what we offer, listen to what they're saying, um, and continue to ta tailor your message there. Same with VCs. We might ask basic questions. We might ask questions that, well, isn't your product similar to this? And you might be like, no. Uh, and, 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 but, but you can say, ah, like, what a great question. Uh, let me, let me explain. So um, I am definitely guilty of uh, correlating like two markets that, that are unclear, but how um, how founders respond can be really helpful, I think, to your to your point. Um, so your user journeys are so useful to so many parts of life, um, and and um, being able to articulate that to every different audience that you have is is really uh, quite a skill that I think we're we're all honing over time of how do we best communicate who we are, what is our value um, in any walk of life. So uh, I'm just wondering, like, I'm assuming a lot of the people here or pretty much everybody here has been bootstrapping their product or their idea uh, up until now. And I uh, wanted to hear your thoughts on when is the right time to stop bootstrapping and to start looking for additional funding to, to know basically what's, what's the time that you do that? How much should you invest in the bootstrapping phase? Uh, difficult question. I actually, for my own company, let me just tell you the story of what happened to my own company, uh, the last company that I did myself. Um, so um, I, I, I did a company that was basically um, one medical for dental, right? So at the time that I was doing it, and it was growing really fast, and I didn't need money, so I didn't, I bootstrapped it myself to get to a bigger round. We got to a lot of revenue we got within a year and a half, which is by any measure, that was a good uh, time to actually go. Uh, we got to around $12 million annual revenue. So in just a year and a half. Uh, so by any measure, that would be a good time to go raise. But now at the same time, one medical wasn't doing that hot. So, and when you would talk to VCs at the time, they were saying, no. So that, it, a thing that in any other time would have been so hot. Well, obviously, if I dropped the valuation, they would have come in, but I, I couldn't, I wouldn't do that. So um, it, it, a thing that at any other time would have been so exciting, it turned into now I had to bootstrap it to the next level, to the next round, and, uh, you know, uh, which turned out to be a good idea that I did it that way, but uh, at the time it, it felt so terrible. Um, but uh, all I'm saying is it's very, it depends. It depends on the, the market. It depends on how, if can you continue? But what I suggest in general, which doesn't always apply, but it, this is as, you know, this is like capitalism that we don't have anything better for this. It's just, uh, you know, it's just better than the next bad, next bad thing. Uh, time, time box it. Uh, just when you're starting in your own head, just imagine, hey, this is how much time I'm going to actually spend on this thing and put some goals to, to and the goal should not be to get, to raise money. This is a terrible goal. The, the goal should be to get to some product milestone in terms of uh, I'm going to have this much traction. I'm going to have this many users, something like this. And then say, I'm going to get to this by this time. Do not put the 
on the, like I raise <laughs> that's a ba really bad goal I can't emphasize more uh, like uh, enough but if, if you have a goal and have a time limit to get to that goal I think that's the best way of managing as to am I going to continue on this and I'm going to uh, just so I would switch to something else the goal orientation really resonates um in terms of bootstrap um, so I recognize uh, that, and that's really um, an important message to share. Is some folks, you know, need to go from um, a job immediately to um, finding the time to go fundraise and step into that. Um, so I will start there. Um, I think what we look for is full-time founders, um, and um, it's great to begin to talk to people who are full-time founders or about to be full-time founders because in their nights and weekends, they've been bootstrapping or thinking or working on idea and are ready to go. But it's about this readiness for um, full-time. And I think that that can come with, we have a fundraising moment. We With this fundraising, we have a goal and that goal orientation. Or we meet founders who've been bootstrapping for a while because of whatever kind of situation they have in their life that allows for that. Um, and that can be a, a really great thing to see because in both circumstances, we really want um, full-time founders who have enough knowledge about what they're hitting with their product milestones, not with their fundraising milestones um, as, as the first thing that they're, they're working towards. And here's why they're coming to you at this moment. Yeah, so I think one of the things you just touched upon is uh, full-time founders and uh, when we talked last, you you mentioned the importance of sort of having a team and a co-founder and all that. That's really all like having everybody behind the same goal. Uh, and I wanted to know, I know a lot of people might be looking for co-founders or something like that. And you had some thoughts on that. And Farid, I wanted, and Jessica, I wanted to ask you what you thought about those. At I, I, Jessica mentioned at the beginning, do uh, you definitely need a co-founder? Um, if even if you look at the stats of successful companies, successful startups, the number of single founder startups that have been successful is so low, uh, and that kind of shows a risk to VCs. Like if you, I'm not saying it's it never happens. No, it does. But it's a it's a statistical kind of a business. The, the number, the percentage of single fa uh, founder companies that are successful is so low. So it's very important to have a founder. Now, again, this comes. This is a little bit uh, my personal opinion on this, and that I um, I'll be curious to uh, to um, uh, hear what Jessica thinks, but. Um, the best type of founder, co-founders that I actually have seen have known each other for a while. They don't go to find a co-founder for the purpose of finding a co-founder. What they, they actually, what I've seen happening that works really well is that you have an idea uh, or, you know, you might be technical, you may not be technical. Oh, by the way, you def one of you has to be technical. Uh, that, sh that just should happen. Uh, both of it's possible that both of you are technical, but one of you should be able to easily sell. So the idea is one of you should be able to focus on selling, the other one on building. That's kind of the idea. Uh, but there are variations that you could actually complement to your uh, each other's skills. But go to your friends that have this missing skill and try to convince them to join your startup. If you can't, that's a bad sign. So that basically means, as Jessica mentioned in the beginning, that it's, it's a, a, treat that person uh, co-founder as a user. So if, you're, if your idea is not interesting enough for your own friend to join your company, you may want to kind of either change the way you pitch it uh, uh, or change your product. Because if you can't convince your own friend, later on, how can you convince a VC? So that's how I look at it. And like random meetups, I... I'm sure it has worked it, and it does work sometimes, but I have not seen one. Yeah, I think this is a, a no silver bullet answer, um, but I also agree co-founders are incredibly important um, just because this is a long, um, challenging journey. And so being in it with someone really matters. With that, it's a long, challenging journey. Being in it with someone 
who is a good fit mutually, again, going back to that, uh, really matters. And so if you've known someone for a long time, if you're just meeting someone and you're considering that co-founding relationship, um, what I like to suggest, and this is advice I do not always take, but go step away, remove your phone, remove the distractions, just bring a notebook um, and think about like, what are the questions you want to know about that person um, and try and come back and, and answer those questions and having um, those honest conversations early, like the, the going will get hard. So try and really be able to have, um, ask yourself the hard questions about what it's like to work with you, what it's like to likely work with them and, and go have that dialogue. Um, and I think that's true for people you've known for a long time, like some of my best friends, I wouldn't wanna be roommates with them. Uh, we learned that in college sort of thing. Um, and I think it's it's very true. Like some of your great friends might not be a great co-founder and you need to go into that uh, eyes wide open. Yeah, and I think I think people need to understand the um, the sort of startup journey that's pretty difficult and not particularly pleasant uh, in many ways. And uh, I'm sure, you know, the, you, you both have experiences in either seeing other people uh, sort of hit those hard times or uh, yourself had those. Um, basically, what would you say is, I know Farid, you have, you're kind of a serial uh, founder. What would you say your uh, main takeaway from those experiences are? Uh, don't do it for the money. It, the, the, it's just a bad idea. <laughs> the, it, almost always uh, you would make more money going to work with a company that is a big company or more established startup. Uh, only do it because you love it. It, it sounds cliche. It, I know I realize it does, but it is true. It's a lonely life. It's, uh, it's up and down. It's, you have to lo love the chaos. Uh, and you have to be able to put a smile on your face throughout the chaos because it's your problem. It's not other, especially when you actually raise money or you have people that are working with you for your company. If something is going wrong in the back, you can't raise or whatever the, 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 uh, is happening in the background, it's for you. It's not for anybody else. You have to put a smile in your, on your face. You have to actually pretend everything is good or it will be bad. So, and you have to love it. Otherwise it would be, it would be tough. Uh, like if every time that this happens to you, you're just gonna, you know, go and just cry, which, yeah, that's fine too. I've done it. <laughs> but even the crying thing, if you're not enjoying that, because that will happen a lot, a lot. Whoever says that they're like, oh, no, everything is rosy. That's just not. So you have to like it. Uh, so, and do not do it for money. So that's that's the main takeaways. Uh, and uh, like I've, I found the three companies that says a lot about me being crazy. I think that sums it up well. And I think um, when you think it's your point on it's a lonely life, often for the founder, you will be grappling with all of these issues on the team, on the product, with the customers, with your funders, when when the cash flow is coming in and you have to solve it yourself. And there's um, I see this uh, even at we're a small fund. Um, and so when there are big challenges, there's a very small group of people to go to when you're a founder. There's mm -hmm. really no one who shares all of the context that you have on all of the issues and, and you know, these trade-offs that you have to make. And so you're really grappling with them alone. I will say events like this, communities like this are a way uh, to meet others who have solved a similar problem and like share and be open about that. Um, no one has all the answers, and, but someone else has grappled with something similarly. Uh, so I do really encourage um, that as well in any, in any um, kind of type of work you're doing, be it a founder or something else. Someone else has solved it and has some learnings for you. Yeah, I think, I think the sort of the passion and making sure that people have something they're really working towards. And I think what, what you're saying is fundraising is not the goal. Uh, it should never be. Um, and the product should always be the main goal. It should resolve or solve an actual real world problem rather than, than anything else. Um, I'm just uh, really thinking about uh, 
you know, the we've talked about the the journey that that you went through. Uh, very, very briefly, we touched upon it. Um, what would you say, uh, like, I, I guess it's very common for startups to have that make or break moment where they get so close to the precipice where they're like just staring down at nothing and they're just about to, to sort of jump. Uh, what would you say uh, was, you know, your, like your experience with that and how, how did you sort of deal with it and sort of build the mental sort of strength to go through it? No, to, to basically sort of uh, prepare yourself for the difficulties of the startup journey. Did, were you able to prepare yourself or did you just go into it and then not think about it? Not knowing what you don't know is actually a blessing. <laughs> so uh, they, for, for a lot of people, and I know a lot of my friends that have done startup, they, that's how they got into it. They, if you know what you're getting into, you're more, more likely not won't get into it. And that's why we're, like, a lot of good startups are coming from people that don't really have experience in that particular area. Because, like, especially, like, for example, me, when I did the dentistry thing, I, and my background is not dentistry at all. So everybody that was in dentistry was saying, uh, but are you crazy, dude? Like, do you know how much, like, regulation is here? How much? Is, and and I did my only connection to dentistry was that like, my friend was a dentist. So, so the ignorance is a blessing in that case a little bit, but uh, I got into it and that was my second company. So I knew that, uh, you know, there was a thing that was happening uh, a long time ago. My first company that I did uh, years ago, um, I did it out of not actually knowing and I, I made a lot of mistakes. It still worked ish, but um, it worked enough that kind of gave me this think as to, hey, the, 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 the joy of making something that doesn't exist, the joy of seeing people using that product, if that joy, if you see the joy and it, you just say, oh, everything that I went through that was hell, uh, totally worth it, then you're a founder. If, if, if you don't have that joy, it just, it's just not there. Uh, so um, th that's kind of what happened to me. I love that. I just to to echo what you said. I think we started with you're all here because we assume there's a problem that you want to solve and you think the status quo is unacceptable and you're willing to do like th some of the things you mentioned to go uh, ch fix that and change that. Um, and so um, it, it's a journey. Um, and so thank you all for kind of, you know, contemplating pushing those boundaries as well. Yeah. Um, so on a related note, from a VC's perspective and just moving ahead in the in the whole startup journey, what are some of the sort of, I guess, the very common and earliest uh, issues that you see uh, startups running into after they've raised a, 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 a round, either seed or, well, I'm, I guess, seed. Uh, after they've raised a round, what are the first sort of hurdles that they'll encounter? Hiring the right people that, that, that by far always, at least for the ones that I've seen, uh, is, is the, the biggest thing. Hiring the right people. Now, what I'm about to say is controversial, depending on who you ask. My way of hiring is try your best to hire the best you can, but fire fast. So that if you see somebody is not working, don't try to find the ideal one with like a unicorn that you think is the best fit. Sure, I'm not saying hire anybody off the street just randomly. I'm, but I'm saying don't look for a, like a 99% match of what your ideal candidate would look like. Because first of all, you could be wrong. That may not be the thing that you actually want. Uh, and yeah, waiting that long may never pay off. So hire as fast, maybe the, if there is the 75% match of the thing that is in your head, just hire. But if you see uh, after like a few months uh, that that person is not working out for whatever reason, first of all, be realistic. It shouldn't be just you don't, just randomly don't get rid of people. That's a bad idea too. But if give them time, give them feedback to kind of correct and uh, you all should also understand. But if it ta is taking too long uh, and you can't make it work, 
let them go because it's a better thing for them. Uh, you don't want people to actually be in an environment that they are not the best um, contributor because it actually for them is a bad, bad thing to mentally. So you are uh, doing yourself and them a favor by actually having them uh, part ways as, as early as you detect that's not a good match. That's kind of the um, um, advice that I give to companies that I invest in, as well as uh, when I do it myself um, in my own companies. Yeah, agree. Talent matters so much. Um, and I think the other, the other thing I would say is um, when you're thinking about that problem, those early user journeys, stay with that user journey and getting that feedback. I think another thing I see is folks who said they did all of their discovery and they, they got it, they understand it, and then they're just building. And if you are leaving that behind and not keeping it up to date, that is a really big problem. Um, and founders are busy, uh, you're, you're selling, you're raising all of those things, you're hiring, I think more than anything. Um, and, but you have to stay close to, to that customer and, and understand what that North Star looks like. So yeah, thanks. Um, just shifting gears a little bit, I uh, wanted to ask you about things that have surprised you as VCs uh, in terms of companies that you thought were going to be successful but ended up sort of fizzling uh, and sort of likewise companies that you didn't think were going to be successful but just exploded. I, I have so many examples of the second one. <laughs> Uh, so many uh, on the first so uh, you miss like the, you know th there are a lot of things and at the end of the day uh, it's you 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 take as a VC you take some risk on some areas that uh, for uh, you know either your firm kind of uh, cares about or you personally care about or is a combination of both and you miss some 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 stuff, uh, and then also based on the same kind of metrics that you go, you decide something is a good investment. But uh, VC is, uh, you know, there is a big risk um, out of many companies that you invest in. A lot of them don't work. The reason that uh, I've seen the ones that I invested in haven't worked, the majority of them is that the the team didn't stay that, that work well together. At least that was the, one of the main reasons that the people, for some reason, they kind of didn't work. Now it could be, uh, I don't know. Uh, they just decided that they don't like each other or a lot of other reasons, but the team actually not working out well was at the top of my list. And then actually what Jessica said, they keep their eye off of the thing that they talked about when they raised the money. They said, oh, but there is this thing here that I think is better. Let's just move to that thing. And uh, that actually is usually not the right move. Yeah, I think a lot of examples both ways. Um, timing matters um, and execution matters as well, I think. Uh, what we're seeing more and more is sobriety on spend, and and um, it's really up to founders to chart that path. Um, to, you know, who can I hire? How long do I have? What is the revenue I need to garner? Um, and and staying ahead of that. Um, but team and proximity to that problem really matters. Thank you. Um, one question that's uh, probably on a lot of people's minds is accelerators we've got a lot of accelerators in the bay area what are your thoughts on on those <laughs> it, it's it's polarized <laughs> so good ones are really good bad ones are really bad uh, basically see if if whatever the accelerator is hiring is aligned with what you have in mind um good accelerators usually but there are even exceptions to this but generally accelerators um, give value to you for free. They usually don't charge you for things, uh, for, for intangible things. Uh, and, and like a lot of good, basically the best, the, the best advice is always free advice. Um, it's if you're paying for it again, there are exceptions. 
But in general, uh, that's how I see it. So accelerators that I see it as the, from the get go, they want to kind of squeeze you and get money out of, get the money that you don't have out of you. It's, it's, it's tough. Uh, to to kind of justify it, and there is a lot of them in Bay Area, but there are also a lot of good ones in Bay Area. So I like I I see it two extremes, either really good or really bad. Yeah, my quick thought is talk to other people, their experience. Did that accelerator add value? Um, do your homework. I'm sure there's lots of Reddit boards. There's there's other boards like like do your research. Um, be mindful of the percentage of equity that um, is exchanged um, and be mindful of what you as a founder um, get out of it and that value and then go double check that your assumption is correct based on what other people um, say about their own experiences. All right. Um, so final question and then we'll have a quick session. Uh, I wanted to ask you both what would you think is the sort of like the top advice, like the, the, the one thing that you wish like founders knew before they went and pitched to a VC or something like that? What is the top of mind thing that you're thinking about? The goal is not to raise money. The goal is to build a good product. You're, uh, the, you shouldn't see the VC as, hey, this is, this is, if I get the money, then everything is solved. No, actually, if you get the money, then the things start. So, and if you have that in mind, it actually kind of comes off when you're talking to the VC. If, if, if it, you, there are signs that you actually are looking at it as to, hey, that money is not for you. That money is to build for building the thing that you said you would build. So if you have that mentality, it actually comes off when you're talking to a VC. Do not have that in mind. Uh, it's not about raising funds. It's about building a product that people love. Yeah, I think um, to echo that, and you can treat it as a conversation. It's a user who hopefully knows a lot about your market, knows some customers, and knows other funders and founders in the space. Um, and you might be fundraising, and that might be a match there. Um, but what, if you treat it as a conversation of what you're excited about building and, and why you're there, um, often it can open up what that conversation is of, I know someone who could be great for a role you're hiring for, um, or I know another fund who is really good at this stuff and will immediately introduce you to a potential customer. So those things happen. Um, and it kind of all goes back to your fundamental, which is um, build a great product because you got to stick with it for a long time. You really have to love it. And you have to also, when you pivot, and if, if you pivot away from something, be open to um, that change as well. All right. Well, thank you very much for the great information. Uh, I think we're going to open up to questions if uh, anybody has some questions for the panelists. Yeah, so uh, we'll start with you. I pass you the microphone. Thank you, Jessica and uh, Farid. <clears throat> Farid, I have uh, two questions for you. First, can you be my mentor? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, second one, um, the toughest question that I face so far when I meet with the investors uh, is, what is your exit strategy? Right? And if you tell that I want to go for an IPO, and some people think, oh, you are not confident enough to make quick money. Or if I say that we want to be acquired or we want to sell um, in a couple of years, then they would. some people would think, of, oh, you don't love it long enough. I mean, um, you know, so it, it's kind of a dicey area for, for um, we are bootstrapping and we have been in revenues. But this is the question where I, I want to pick your brain and, and, and see what, what, what would you suggest. Um, uh, don't think about it. Yeah. Don't think about it. Uh, build the thing that people love. Exit and uh, VCs. Uh, if some VCs and a lot of the good ones actually ask, may ask you as to what how, what do you think they exist. They're, that's not the reason they're asking you. They just want to hear how you think about things. Uh, it's not like nobody's going to tie you down to, hey, oh, I want to. So don't say it as if that's your exit strategy. Say it as to show that you thought about this way or that way. And don't 
think about it as to, hey, what you're actually heading to, because that's, that's actually the wrong mentality. You, you, you're not making the product to exit. You're making a product because you love it and you think customers will love it. Exit will come. Any other? Oops. I am currently struggling with the full-time founder question. Um, nights and weekends, that's what we're doing. But um, even with accelerators, they're like, oh, you're not working on it full-time. You must not love it enough. No, we have a mortgage. <laughs> like yeah. that, It's becoming like a big barrier to entry. Um, and I guess, what are your recommendations? I'm not raising money to raise money. I'm raising money because we're, we're getting to the point in product milestones where we need it. Um, we're still hitting product milestones, still hitting go to market milestones, but it would make it happen faster. And I guess it's becoming like, they're not even listening to that. It's just like, well, you're not working out full time, so you must not care. And that's, I don't know. I'm, I'm not from money. I'm not, it's, yeah. a, it's a problem. No, so no, what no. do you recommend? I think that um, makes a lot of sense. And and as we talked about, not everyone has, has the opportunity to go bootstrap full time. Um, and uh, I am challenged with nights and weekends work. So if I had a, a side project, I think I am not good at um, kind of closing my day, whatever my day job is, and then going to go do that. I think other people are quite impressive at doing that. And um, as we were discussing, if you have those milestones that you are hitting internally um, to go be ready for a fundraise to step into that full time, that's what we look for is um, what, like, if you have all of the product conviction ready to go to raise and you are successful in a fundraise, would that allow you to step into this full time? Um, and kind of asking the question, what is needed for me to take this on full time? Can I spend my nights and weekends? It sounds like you might have a team or someone else you're working with to go do that and step into that. Um, or is that not feasible for me right now based on where the product is? We can't raise against it. And I actually need to keep pushing this on nights and weekends. Um, and so it, it's a bit of kind of what, what you need in your life and how ready are you to go make that fundraise happen so it can become a full-time thing. Yeah, I guess what I'm finding is even that answer, like if we had the money, we would be in it full-time. It hasn't been like, sufficient at this point, which has been really interesting for me. I would reframe as understanding what you need to get to a fundraise. How far away are you from that fundraise? And then you repitch as we are here fundraising, which will allow us to meet these milestones. And if you are successful in doing that, you are then able to go full time. So you're saying we're actually meeting the moment because now is the time where we're ready to step in full time. And you'll hear, hear back from the market, but you need to be ready for that moment of we're fundraising. Here, are the, here is the amount we're fundraising. Here are the milestones it gets us. And it does allow me to live in this very expensive place that we live if you're based here. Um, and, and that's how I would reframe it is like, are we ready as a company and idea to go make this a full-time thing. Okay. Yep. Um, how you doing, Jessica and Fareed? I love your responses, Fareed. Um, so my question is more when speaking to an investor. So what do you view as mo most important when speaking to an investor? Is it more important to speak on what the product is now or your future ideas for the product. So for instance, like if I'm pitching Instagram, do I go up and say, hey, I have a, a image for an app that people can go and like pictures? Or do I come and say, hey, I have, have these amazing ideas. One day people are gonna be able to speak over video. One day people are gonna be, so like which, which way do you think would be better to approach that? Tell them what the product is and tell them and show them that the, the a few users that you have already love it. Show it to them that, that, that you should you should educate them as to this is the current product. You can touch up on uh, what you have in mind for the future, sure. But you should actually talk about what you have, 
as well as show the proof that it works. Not it works in terms of it doesn't have bugs. No, no. It works as in people you, who are already on your product, are they love something about your product. And you should be able to show a bit numbers. Uh, so that back to the thing as at, make sure there is analytics in your product and you know what you are measuring and why you are measuring it. Don't randomly just measure things. Uh, like DAO may not mean much for a product uh, that, you know, uh, Mao might mean something. It, it depends on your product. So find, it's not the VC's job to find out what's, what to measure to show it's good. If you actually don't show that, you, you, uh, you miss the mark. So, back, back. So, it's a good, good question. So, let's say you're you're playing this 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 length of time, and your uh, your average is this much, right? So, you say, hey, uh, I average one point every five minutes. Just a random number, right? But an average player on the market averages one point every thirty-five minutes. So see, now you thought about what to tell them, and this is like off the cuff kind of a thing. Figure out what to measure and what, like, what is meaningful to measure to show your product is good. It, it's very case dependent. It, I can't, there is no silver bullet. Okay. But what, like, what I'm really trying to get to is like, I think sometimes it's hard when you have like, like what you were saying about fundraising, when you have like a small amount of money and you can only showcase like a small bearing of what your application is doing to go to an investor and ask them to invest like what you need or what you believe that could accelerate your product. It's like sometimes it's a reach because it's like most people want like solidarity. Most people want like something that they know is going to come through. Not yeah, like that that's why startups are hard. I I I don't have a good answer for you because like the thing is, if you can't really, again, there are there are situations that you would just. There, you know, you would say, "Hey, I want the money to do this X and so you're selling a story." Um, some some VCs actually like accept it, depending on a lot of factors. But the thing that always works is that you should find the thing that works and show it to them in with numbers. This always works. The other stuff sometimes works. So if you want some like uh, a good answer as to like focus on this thing the whole point of it not being deterministic that's why it like not you don't see that many successful founders like not because they don't work hard they do it's just the thing that they thought would get them to sh get get some traction it just wasn't the thing so and that's why back to the time time box it for yourself kind of so that you don't get burnt on a thing that is just the wrong path and you pivot to something else that's that's also very important time boxing I haven't done a question in the back yet, so uh, really liked all the insights. And uh, Fareed, you had mentioned that when you're looking to see if uh, a product is fundable, one, you mainly look at product and the founders, uh, what they bring to the table, and then user traction. Now, how important is the market size that this product solves, and is user revenue, early revenue, uh, like how important is that? Or is just users who love the product enough but aren't paying it? Yeah, I can take that. Um, depends on how early you are. We need to have a strong understanding of the market, but it's more about how you're explaining the market to us and do we believe and have conviction there. Um, depending on stage, again, um, having LOIs and, and early beta tests, I think we take those with a grain of salt. We want to see how they're going, um, but it's really meaningful when people convert. When if folks aren't converting, it's not a good sign. Um, and the further, like, once you've done a pre-seed and a seed, we are, I think, more and more expecting that that real revenue as well. All right. Another question in the back? Yeah. Um, you spoke about uh, the value of warm intros earlier on. 
Um, and I was curious that this seems like a sort of catch 22 potentially. So I'd love, maybe you could unpack it a bit. Um, it sounds like, you know, it's good to have someone, you know, introduce you to someone they know, and that makes sense. How do you get to the first someone who can make the intro? Right. So <laughs> I guess, you know, if, if we is, get like, break it down, how do you find the founders who are going to make the intros to the investors? These things. And how do you find the uh, investors who aren't the right fit, but who would introduce you to people who are the right fit? Right. So that for the second one, the investors that uh, just are not the right fit, that's just random. You can't plan to get to the wrong investor. That's just a bad plan. So uh, the way to kind of look at it is uh, come to these events, talk to people. You become friends. Some of them may have already invested, uh, like uh, have other companies they may have investors already they may be able to actually introduce you and to other people your friends and yes it's hard um, i can't uh, disagree with you it's a difficult thing to do okay we'll have one last question and then we can hey guys so starting um a bunch of companies and hiring a, a lot of people hundreds of people I kind of started what you what you said, Farid, about uh, one thing that made the company fail is the team, right? So I kind of figured that from the beginning that would kind of be the Achilles heel. So talking about co-founders and advisors, right? So my thing is, even though my title is a, is a founder, I think my role is more of a coach, right? Getting people in different positions, right? Getting people in those positions. So um, one of the guys that's actually the head engineer for who actually built our software, I actually brought him in as an advisor. And these different people actually brought him in as, as an advisor instead of co-founders because I didn't want to go through the team kind of deteriorating and having all these different issues. So would that make a difference of bringing these people on as advisors or still having them as co-founders? Uh, that's actually a good thing. So it's like a, t a trial period of somebody being on your team and then you deciding that this is a good thing. It's, yeah, if it works, it's much better than cold ones to just start as co-founders. Definitely, I would say it's not as good as somebody that you've known forever. Uh, honestly, if I have to actually say why I've had, like I've started three companies, one of them I'm just starting actually. Um, it, the only reason, <laughs> the, the, I, the only reason that the other two actually worked were because I did them with the friends that these are not actually close, like that close of friend of mine, that these are not people that I would actually just go on trips with normally now they are, but back in the day, it, they were not. So th these are people that I've known for a long time. I've known them. And I could actually have, have a relationship which is it's built upon years and years. So, yes, the better way is uh, doing that. But if that's not available, uh, doing the advisor thing or uh, something of that realm makes sense. Yes. I think my only question there would be, are they focused and are they incented to spend the time you need to be successful? So that would be my takeaway. All right, guys, sorry. Right. I have to leave. I have to go to the airport. So yes, you yes, should plane. continue. Great talking to you guys. Thank uh, you appreciate it. Thank you. I think, yeah, I think now is the time to wrap up. Thanks a lot for your time. And Farid, I know you're in a rush. <laughs> All right. Have a safe flight. And um, yeah, see you around. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right well, thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, for the great talk. Thank you guys for coming. And I will pass the mic back to Yasmin. Well, thank you so much for being here. It was an amazing conversation. Um